We're coming on the air with stories of desperation. Thousands of people running from the war zone in Ukraine. With things getting so tense, even one of our NBC teams on the ground was held at gunpoint at one point. One woman saying she can't even recognize her home anymore. City is just dust. Ahead, her story and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Lester Holt. And the U.S. is laying out new sanctions against Russia and not just against the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin's inner circle, they're getting hit hard, too. So who are these oligarchs and how did they get all of their money? We're going to explain. Here in Washington, President Biden's Supreme Court pick meeting and greeting for the first time with top senators ahead of her newly scheduled hearings just a few weeks from now. We've got those details just in on the timeline and how Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is now pitching herself. Plus, an officer breaking down on the stand saying he feared for his life during that late night police raid that led to the killing of Breonna Taylor. What to expect in tomorrow's closing arguments. And parents of transgender kids in Texas now suing the state's governor, worried they accused of child abuse for helping their kids get gender affirming care. Why they say the order terrorizes their families later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And tonight, both Ukraine and President Biden say Russia could be committing war crimes, with the Pentagon saying in just the last hour that Vladimir Putin's military is trying and hoping to make up for lost time because over the last couple days, they haven't made much progress near Kyiv. Here's a look at what's happening on the ground at the damage in Kharkiv. This is a building there on fire. It collapsed. Emergency crews sifting through what's left. A senior defense official telling NBC News Russia's hitting civilian targets on purpose. In Kyiv, you have kids being treated in the basement of a hospital to try to get away from the bombing. That official also says the bombing there in Kyiv is getting more and more aggressive. And in Lviv, look at this, train stations crammed with hundreds of thousands of people trying to get out. Here's how one woman described what it's like on one of those trains. It was like giving your, pretty much giving your soul to God every second. I thought this particular moment I can die and I just prayed and I said uh, goodbye everyone and I understood that for four hours in a, in a completely dark train we can be dead in every second, any second. So Kharkiv is one of the four cities Russian troops are closing in on. You see the others here. There's Kherson, Mariupol and of course Kyiv. Those are hugely important strategically and it's where millions of people live. And then look at the attacks, right, because we're seeing more of them. And look at that cluster there in Kyiv. A defense official tells NBC News more than 80 percent of Russian forces near Ukraine are now actually in Ukraine. I mean, it's quite literally from every angle. Now, today, you have the United Nations condemning the invasion. Nearly three quarters of countries voted to back a symbolic resolution supporting Ukraine. Just five voted against it. And then President Biden today breaking out new sanctions against Russia and Belarus, targeting their militaries, their oligarchs, Moscow's oil and gas industry. NBC News has also exclusively learned from our sources that the U.S. has delivered 200 Stinger missiles to Ukraine. But the White House has its limits on what it can and will do, as Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin told our Lester Holt in an exclusive interview. Ukrainians and others have called for this idea of a no-fly zone to be patrolled by the U.S. to keep the Russian airplanes out of the sky. Is that a non-starter for you? President Biden's been clear, Lester, that, uh, you know, U.S. troops uh, won't, uh, won't fight Russia uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and if you establish a no-fly zone, certainly in order to enforce that no-fly zone, uh, you'll have to engage uh, Russian aircraft. And again, that would put us uh, uh, at war with Russia. That's the first time, by the way, we're seeing that excerpt from that interview. You're going to see more of it tonight on NBC Nightly News. Lester Holtz with the defense secretary, 630 Eastern on NBC. I want to bring in Cal Perry, who's live in Lviv, Ukraine. Cal, you know, we heard from the military, this defense official, that the shelling on Kyiv is getting actually worse. Tell us a little bit about what it's like for you on the ground. Kyiv and Kharkiv. We understand yeah. that the shelling is now really bad in the city of Kyiv, and it's starting to hit those residential areas. This is something that has developed in the last 24 hours. There was, in the first four or five days of this, where not only quote unquote pinpoint strikes because nothing is a pinpoint strike but there seemed to be military targets to the first four or five days on behalf of the Russian military they were securing airfields they even struck yesterday that that tower that uh, TV tower so you could consider those targets but civilians were dying now civilian areas are being shelled that is what is happening that has what has changed in the last 24 hours Ali we played a little bit of this this gut punch of an interview that you did with a woman who is trying to get away from the violence in Kharkiv and I'm struck by what she told you about 
you know, she, she's not even sure she survived. What does that mean? I think she's shell shocked. I, I think this is a nation that you're starting to see um, become emotionally really damaged by this war, especially the folks that are fleeing east. One of the things that she really wanted to do, though, was bear witness to the world of what she saw. Take a listen. I want people to know that we have been killed by the country that wanted to take over take Ukraine over and they wanted to kill our people for being patriotic. I want people to know that this is true because I, I saw it personally. This is somebody who spent five years in the city of Seattle recently, and so it was very important to her, she said, to counter this misinformation, this disinformation that she sees all around her. Certainly, she views everything the Russians are being told as disinformation. And in Russia, they're being told that civilian targets are not being hit and that civilians are not dying. And, of course, that is very much not the case. The reality on the ground here is more and more civilians are dying every day. The question is, how do you, how do you put a number on that, right, which is so difficult to do? NBC News can't confirm some of these numbers, but we are getting some new details in from the Ukrainian government from the Russian military, too, right? Yeah. Yeah, so on the civilian side of it, the Ukrainians saying today that up to 2,000, at least 2,000 civilians could have already died in this conflict. Again, hard to really get a number on it because of all that fierce fighting. And on the Russian side today, in admission, they said to their people that at around 498, I think it was the exact number, 498 soldiers had been killed. You talk to the Ukrainian government, they'll say it's as high as 6,000. Western defense officials are putting it around 5,800. You can see there the range in those numbers, partly because it's not becoming clear yet, also because there's a lot of propaganda out there. The Russians want to try to put their best foot forward to the Russian people. Um, obviously not realistic of what's happening on the ground here, Hallie. Cal Perry, I really appreciate you being there in Lviv. And Cal, it's cold. It's snowing behind you, right? I mean, this is they're, they're in these conditions. It's freezing. Yeah, and I worry about the folks sleeping outside. Right. I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of people now sleeping outside. It's only going to get worse. Cal Perry, please um, stay safe. Thank you for bringing us that perspective from the front lines or from the people that you're talking to. Thank you. You know, Cal's not the only member of our team who's there in Ukraine on the ground. And to give you a sense of just how on edge everyone is, how tense things are, listen to what it was like for our correspondent Matt Bradley and his team as they were trying to drive further in the center of Ukraine. We were at a checkpoint and we were taken out at gunpoint by Ukrainian soldiers, and we were made to kneel in the snow with our hands up, and it was terrifying. They were cocking their Kalashnikovs behind us, uh, and we were just very afraid because everybody is on a knife's edge here. Um, you know, th these are, are people who didn't consider us to be uh, to be enemies, uh, but at the same time, they were on. They were so tense um, that we were just worried that one false move. Uh, would end us in very, very serious trouble. So uh, wow. every every step of the way has been extremely, extremely tense. Matt Bradley there, he and his team are okay as they keep up coverage of the fighting and of the humanitarian crisis that is getting worse and worse every day with the backdrop of that extreme tension that you just heard described there, right, with Secretary of State Tony Blinken calling the human cost of this war staggering. The U.N. says more than 800,000 refugees have already left Ukraine. And you can see here this new video. Faces of children. They're just kids. They're getting in on trains in Poland with their families, holding on to whatever they can as they try and get away from violence in their home countries. Today, America's ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, is calling on the world to help all refugees. I want to echo the U.N. Refugee Agency's call to help and welcome all those fleeing conflict without regard to race or nationality. Refugees are refugees. I want to bring in Kelly Kobie, who is near the Ukrainian border in Poland, uh, again with us covering this humanitarian crisis. Kelly, it's good to see you. And what we just heard from the ambassador to the U.N. there seemed to allude to something that we've heard reports of on the ground, these reports of racism against Africans in Ukraine trying to cross into Poland. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, there have been several reports of Africans, African students uh, and others trying to get across the border and, and claiming that they've been stopped. They've been uh, told to get off a bus in one case, uh, blocked from getting on trains and blocked from crossing the borders, told to get to the back of the line in some of these incredibly long lines at border crossings. Uh, the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees acknowledged uh, that these cases have happened. These uh, are 
are valid incidents of discrimination uh, inside Ukraine um, and, and called on the Ukrainians to make sure that everyone has safe passage. He did say that uh, there's no uh, sense that this is a state policy, uh, but that it is happening uh, in a, on occasion. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell because of the situation on the ground how often it's happening, but it is happening in country, and he's calling on the Ukrainians to make sure that, as uh, Ambassador Greenfield said, yeah. that refugees are treated like refugees. Doesn't matter what your passport says, doesn't right. matter what your skin color is, you're fleeing war. How is the process going overall, Kelly, of trying to get refugees into Poland? I mean, from what we've heard from our uh, the folks we're talking to on the other side of the border, things have smoothed out a bit uh, at the Medica crossing, which is that the busiest land crossing in Poland. People are getting through a little bit quicker. But keep in mind, temperatures, as Cal said, are freezing yeah. and it is still taking several hours. It's also improved at the train station, which is that busy, very busy train station where we've been reporting from over the past couple of days. They're bringing in eight trains a day now, Hallie. That's a significant increase from over the weekend when we were seeing maybe two, three, four uh, at the most. Eight trains now, and they've really quickened up the process of getting, pe keeping people on the train, keeping them warm until they're, they take groups out at a time, get them processed through the train station and on to uh, connecting with relatives or wherever they're going to go um, in the country. So it is getting better. There's also a piece of this of people who are trying to get back into Ukraine because they want to fight. Is that something you're hearing? Yeah, and it's incredible. It's something we've been seeing for the past couple of days. We talked to one young man today who was in the line uh, trying to board the train back to Ukraine. And it, he's 25 years old. He's an IT engineer. And he was on holiday in uh, on vacation, actually not on vacation, sorry, on a work trip in Mexico when the war broke out. Take a listen. It's hard, but uh, it's, I think, the only right option for me. On Ukraine is premeditated and unprovoked. President Biden there on the road in Superior, Wisconsin, keeping up that tradition of presidents getting out of Washington after a State of the Union to push their domestic agendas. In this case, for the president to highlight that bipartisan infrastructure law. And the pick of Wisconsin, probably not a coincidence, right? A key state in the 2020 election that the president won by less than a percentage point and a state that has all eight of its House seats up for grabs in this year's midterms. Joining me now is Kristen Welker over at the White House. And Kristen, listen, the president is clearly making that political pivot after the State of the Union, battleground state, and it seems like Wisconsin would be a pretty obvious choice for him. Absolutely. You laid out the reasons why, Hallie, the fact that it is a key battleground state. He only won it by about 20,000 votes. So he knows that in order to get reelected, it's a state that he's going to have to hold on to. That's one of the reasons he's there. He's also talking, of course, about his infrastructure legislation that you talked about, that bipartisan law that passed. So it allows him to do two things. One, to talk about a promise fulfilled on bipartisanship, the fact that the legislation did get Republican support and the fact that he did get some movement on this critical piece of legislation that presidents past have tried to get done, Hallie. And President Biden repeatedly says that ultimately this did get done under his administration. The goal here is to try to point to some shovel-ready projects that are underway that are actually going to get people back to work so that people in these communities can see the real-world impacts of this legislation. Now, of course, we're also seeing the president not just talk about the legislation that was passed, but he's pushing and calling on Congress to pass his Build Back Better plan, although you might not hear him use that phrase, Hallie, because won't. Democrats <laughs> have decided it's not too popular. As you know, it's been stalled for quite some time. So last night you heard the president call on Congress to pass elements of what was once known as his Build Back Better plan, provisions that would do things like lower health care costs, lower the cost of prescription drugs, and child care costs as well. Now, of course, uh, those provisions did not have all Democrats on board. Senator Joe Manchin was not on board with Build Back Better. And when he was asked about the president's speech last night, he effectively 
signaled that he hasn't moved. He isn't any more willing to support a big sweeping piece of legislation than he was several months ago. Hallie. Let me pull up a map, Christine, because I think it's illuminative of what the Biden administration's plans are um, as we get closer to you know the meat of this midterm year, if you will. You got the vice president, the second gentleman, a lot of the president's cabinet spread out really in the Midwest, in the East, trying to sell his message again in states that are going to be important for some of these hard fought elections that are coming up, Kristen. I mean, clearly they have their eye on trying to change some of the narrative around the president and the economy, for example, and to tout what they're doing to to get more money into people's wallets um, and get those, frankly, approval ratings up to a place that the White House would probably rather see. I'm sure they'll say we don't look at approval ratings, whatever. You know, let's be real. They're very aware of them. They are very aware of those approval ratings. Hallie, you're absolutely right. The vice president in another big battleground state, North Carolina, and they're fanned out in all of these critical states. Look, the president is facing headwinds. His approval ratings, the fact that you have inflation at record highs. And this administration has been criticized by some Democrats who say you haven't done a good enough job of selling what they perceive to be the successes of this president. And so, yes, it is tradition that you have the president his cabinet officials, administration officials out on the road to sell his messaging in the wake of the State of the Union address. But this does come at a pivotal moment because we are in an election year. And so I think the messaging is going to be really important. And to that point, Hallie, I would just underscore something that we heard from the president last night that got a lot of attention when he said, instead of defunding the police, fund the police. That's something that got bipartisan praise in the halls of Congress last night. So it was really fascinating to watch. But clearly it's a message to his party that they should be tacking to the center as they face these really tough midterm races that they're facing, Hallie. Kristen Welker on the North Bond of the White House. Great to see you, Welks. Appreciate it. You too. Wheels in motion over on Capitol Hill for what is probably going to be a pretty tough confirmation fight. Uh, even if, in fact, she will get through, we're talking about Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, with support from Democrats in the Senate. Take a look. She had a bunch of those meet and greets. They all started today. And these are the, the top people she needs to talk to on both sides of the aisle. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican, Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee Dick Durbin, Ranking Member Chuck Grassley. We told you last week a little about how this process goes down, and it's happening fast. The president only officially formally nominated her five days ago. But today, we got some new details on the timeline. Hearings will start March 21st. It's only a few weeks away, gang. She's got questioning on the 22nd and the 23rd. I'm sure you will watch that live here uh, as well as across the country on live TV, wrapping up on the 24th. Let me bring in now from Capitol Hill, Leanne Caldwell. Um, Leanne, let me start with that timeline because these are new details. We knew based on the reporting that you and our team has done that this was going to be an accelerated timeline, right? Democrats yeah. want to get this done. They want to get her locked in and confirmed before they go on recess, like spring break, April, right? Yeah, that's right. They want to move quickly. Uh, the reason they want to move quickly is because there's such a slim majority that the Democrats hold in the Senate, and they already have some problems with that. They have three Democrats out right now for personal reasons. Ben Ray Lujan had a stroke that he's recovering from. Senator Padilla has COVID right now. Senator Feinstein's husband just died, so he, she is out mourning him. And so they know that anything can happen, so they want to move as quickly as possible. And the fact that Senator Durbin announced that these hearings are going to start on March 21st, that means that there will be about 24 days from the time that she was announced, that President Biden announced her, to the first day of the hearing. Well, that's about half the amount of time that is, is that most nominees take from when their nomination is announced into their first hearing. It's usually about 50 days. So there is some evidence there that Democrats are moving much more quickly than in past, except for the last Senate or Supreme Court confirmation, which is Amy Coney Barrett. Of course, they were running up against a presidential election that Republicans wanted to get this done before right. then. So, so we got this time, this hearing, this timeline for these hearings that are going to start in a few weeks. Until then, she's going to be meeting and greeting with, in theory, all 50, you know, all, all the Democratic senators. Any senators who maybe don't want to meet with her? Like, do we think that may happen? 
Perhaps. Uh, she's going to meet with all members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the, the, there's already meetings scheduled, including with Senator Josh Hawley, someone who is on the far right, someone who is not going to support her, but he's still going to meet with her. And so we can expect the members of the Judiciary Committee and then additional members at will. And so that is what the top Republican on the Judiciary Committee says is their on his only concern with the timeline. He just wants to make sure that every Republican who wants to meet with her before these hearings start have the opportunity to do so. And as long as that is the case, that that opportunity presents itself, then he's fine with moving quickly. Um, and so we'll see how what the schedule looks like. We'll see what members decide to meet with her, and some just might not, and just listen to the hearings, and that's how they'll make up their decision. Leanne Caldwell, live for us on the Hill. I know running from office to office, following where she's going. It's been a day for you, Leanne. Thank you. Yep. On the pandemic front, there's this new plan being rolled out by the White House today, this sort of test to treat strategy to help us all learn to live basically with the coronavirus. Main takeaways, protect against and treat COVID, get ready for new variants, try to prevent shutdowns and vaccinate the world. You say it like it's nothing, right? I mean, these are these are tall orders, but this is what the Biden administration says needs to get done in order to try to put this pandemic phase behind us. The COVID response team says it wants us all to get out of that crisis mode we've been in and get to a place where the virus isn't going to be so disruptive to our lives every day. Check out this graphic. This tells the story of where things are now compared to a year ago. And look, case numbers, deaths, hospitalizations, similar. But look at the number of people who are vaccinated. 215 million people now versus last year when there were only 30 million. That's a big difference. I want to bring in Meg Terrell, who uh, are one of our best experts on all things COVID. Meg, I'm really glad to have you on. Walk us through what Americans need to know about this plan. There's some money that Congress has to green light, et cetera. What are the key takeaways um, in your view? Yeah, so it really covers the gamut, as you laid out, being prepared for potential new variants, being able to detect those really well, stay ahead of potential surges, and make sure that we have the tools in place to take care of people in the event that we are dealing with another emergency situation, as well as to continue to deal with the situation that we're currently in. Uh, as you mentioned, there is funding that is needed for a lot of this, and specifically being able to acquire more treatments, uh, vaccines, and tests, being able to make sure we have enough preventive treatments for people who are immunocompromised and ensuring access to boosters for them. Um, also making sure that the investment in testing continues to make sure we're never at this shortage again and to make sure tests are affordable. And then, as you mentioned, this whole global effort as well, not just supplying the vaccines themselves, but actually supporting the efforts to get people vaccinated around the world. That right now appears to be the bigger problem. And also supplying supplies like PPE and oxygen to other countries. All of these things, in in addition to setting up centers for excellence to treat long COVID are things they're talking about needing new funding for. There's also something that I'm interested in, a deadline coming up soon, because when we talk about returning to normal, that for a lot of people includes traveling. There's this uh, there's this precautionary thing that expires middle of March, right, on, on whether you should have masks on federal transportation, meaning on planes. That lifts on March 18th, but the White House, the Biden administration could extend that. Sounds like they haven't made a decision yet. What is your sense of which way that may go? Yeah, the CDC just keeps saying we're going to revisit that in a couple weeks. And Dr. Walensky was asked today, what is the difference scientifically between wearing a mask on a plane or a train versus wearing a mask anywhere else where they've essentially just lifted the mask requirements indoors for most of the country? Here's how Dr. Walensky explained the difference. Just in terms of travel, we have to look not only at um, the science with regard to transmission in masks, but also the epidemiology and the frequency that we may encounter a variant of concern or a variant of interest in our travel corridors. So she's essentially saying there is a difference between traveling and not traveling, essentially, when it comes to masks. This is only two weeks away, so we'll have to see if they end up extending it. They've been so flexible with masks everywhere else. It'd be sort of surprising if they yeah. kept it in place. But she did argue that there is a difference. Meg Terrell, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Coming up here on the show, a dramatic day in court after a former cop took the stand in the trial connected to the raid that killed Breonna Taylor. What Brett Hankinson had today in his defense. Plus, more baby formula recalled after the death of a second infant. We've got more on the FDA's warning coming up later in the show.
The former Louisville police officer who was part of that deadly raid on Breonna Taylor's apartment taking the stand today in tears. Brett Hankison was defending his decision to fire his gun during the raid, testifying he shot because he thought his colleagues were in danger. Watch. I knew they were trying to get to him. And it appeared to me that they were being executed with this rifle. I returned fire through, excuse me, through the sliding glass door. Remember, Breonna Taylor was killed after officers beat down her door while executing a search warrant and her boyfriend shot, thinking they were intruders, which set off a volley of shots from other officers on scene. Hankison is charged with endangering three people, including a five-year-old, after prosecutors say his bullets went into their apartment. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. So, Gabe, I think it's important to remind people that Hankison is not directly charged in the death of Breonna Taylor. We've talked about this on that show. That was a controversial decision that was made months ago. But he still brought her up today. Explain that. What else stood out to you? Uh, yeah, Hallie, and you're right. Officer, former officer Hankinson is charged with three counts of wanton endangerment, as you mentioned. And the FBI determined that it was not his bullets that actually killed Breonna Taylor, as you said. The bullets went into a uh, neighboring apartment. But there were several things that stuck out at me today. Some of the uh, sound that you just played there, Hankinson in motion and all on the stand. But he also described how he did think that he did nothing wrong, at least criminally. And at one point, Breonna Taylor's mother walked out of the courtroom. Let's also play some more of his testimony. Take a listen. I felt sincere empathy for them. That was something, if my daughter was, was shot at or bullets came into our house, that would be very concerning, and I apologize to her for that. And Miss Taylor's family, it was just, she didn't need to die that night. So you hear that objection there. But yes, Hankinson saying that Breonna Taylor did not need to die mm -hmm. that night. But he also described in detail, Hallie, at one point, getting up from the witness stand and kind of you know, acting out what he was, uh, you know, what his position was as that door was being rammed. And it was just a, a very emotional uh, that he that he took to stand. He described how when his uh, one of his colleagues was hit with a bullet, he felt that uh, his fellow officers were being executed. And this was probably the first detailed account from Brent Hankinson that we have heard about. Uh, again, he's not uh, charged directly right. with causing uh, Breonna Taylor's death, but this is this this trial is beginning getting a lot of attention because of the fact that, you know, it's in connection uh, to the raid uh, where she did not uh, make it out alive. And there have been so many questions from, you know, her family, people close to her about accountability in this instance that, you know, were left unresolved when the decision was made not to bring more serious charges against any of the officers involved. I imagine the interest, obviously, you just said it, Gabe, like very high interest in this. A lot of people watching it. You know, you said Breonna Taylor's mom even showing up today. Yeah, and that's right. During uh, opening uh, statements, both the prosecution and the defense said that this case was not about Breonna Taylor. But, Hallie, you just said it. This is, you know, to think that, you know, her name would not come up during this trial or that, uh, you know, it, it, it would not hang heavily over this trial. It just doesn't make any sense. Brown Taylor's parents, even though, you know, they, they've long said that they wanted justice uh, for Brianna Taylor. And in this case, Hankinson, if convicted, he faces up to five years in prison. Uh, that has not been enough uh, for Brianna Taylor's family. Of course, you know, attorney Ben Crump um, has long said that he, he could not understand why charges were brought in this instance where Officer Hankinson fired into an adjacent apartment with a white neighbor, and yet Breonna Taylor, a black woman, uh, that her death, um, you know, that, that uh, none of the officers faced char face charges for her death. And I was there in Louisville, Hallie, when the decision was made not to criminally charge these officers with her death. There was a lot of frustration, a lot of anger there, uh, you know, two years since this, uh, since this raid. So uh, this uh, trial continues. Closing arguments now set for tomorrow. Again, Hankinson faces up to five years in prison if convicted on those three wanton endangerment. Counts. Gabe Gutierrez, I'm glad to see you reporting on this, stand on top of it. I remember seeing you, you know, there when, when all this was going down um, as far as the, the charges not too long ago. Thank you, Gabe. Still to come here on this show, police in New Zealand cracking down on protests against COVID vaccine mandates. We'll tell you how the country's parliament is dealing with it next in the five things. And there's been a lot of talk about going after Russian oligarchs after the invasion of Ukraine. So could you tell me who they are?
I don't know. We figured we'd try to explain some of it, how they got so rich after the break. The Justice Department today launching a task force to go after Russian oligarchs and their assets. We're going to tell you who they're targeting when we go live to Moscow in just a minute. But first, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, New Zealand police today cracking down on protests in the country's capital because of COVID vaccine mandates. Dozens of people were arrested. Look at this from camps, basically these like tent camps that have been set up outside parliament. You saw even at one point a fire outside one of the tents. This has been going on for about three weeks now, inspired by those trucker protests in Canada we've been talking about. Number two, the FDA is expanding a recall on certain kinds of powdered baby formula after a second baby died. The agency had previously warned parents about certain products from Abbott Nutrition. Well, the company is now pulling back even more batches of Similac off the shelves. This is the second time since September that a baby has died from powdered formula. Very serious. We're going to stay on top of that story. Number three, Fitbit is recalling nearly 2 million smartwatches because of a risk they may burn you. It has this kind of battery in it that can overheat and like actually burn your wrist. 78 people said it happened to them. Two even said it was third degree burns. A million of those watches have been sold here in the U.S. Number four, TikTok, getting a closer look from a group of eight state attorneys general. Not because they're trying to see what's trending or what the latest meme is. They want to know what does it mean for kids' mental health, for their physical health? This is an extension of an investigation that's already looking into some similar concerns with Instagram. Number five, that cargo ship that was on fire, had a whole bunch of luxury cars in it, finally has sank in the Atlantic Ocean. We told you a couple weeks back when the Felicity Ace caught fire near Portugal, carrying Porsches and Audis and Bentleys. Oh my, the estimated cost of everything it lost, close to $440 million. I'm going to say three words, and you may not know what they are. I didn't until a little bit ago. Task Force Klepto Capture. I know what it is now, and you will too, because that's what the Justice Department has set up, this special initiative to go after Russian oligarchs. Merrick Garland, the attorney general here, you see him, announced this earlier after the president previewed this move in his State of the Union address last night. And it's an interagency effort, meaning you have a lot of parts of government working on this. They're keeping an eye on a lot of things, export controls, anti-money laundering, tax enforcement, and more. Basically, all of the things that the U.S. can do economically to try to enforce sanctions on Russian oligarchs. They're even seizing assets like yachts or luxury apartments that may have been acquired from, quote, unlawful conduct. But what exactly is a, an oligarch? Like, what it, we talk about Russian oligarchs. What it, who is that? How did they get all their money in the first place? Let's find out. The modern Russian oligarch's story starts back in 1989. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The wall fell, and soon after, in 1991, so did the Soviet Union. Eastern Europe is free. The Soviet Union itself is no more. This is a victory for democracy and freedom. After almost 70 years of Russian communism, where the state controlled everything, the Russian people saw huge political and economic change practically overnight. For most regular Russians, this seismic shift was chaotic. But for a select few businessmen known as oligarchs, they managed to rise to the top. The word itself is Greek, derived from oligarchy and means rule of the few. An oligarch is one of those few. With the state no longer controlling major economic sectors, rich men who had been gaining wealth often in Russia's legitimate businesses and allegedly in the black market stood ready to take control if they had political connections. And many of them did. 1996, it looked as if the communists might return to power in the presidential election. Oligarchs stood together to help Boris Yeltsin's re-election. Infighting inside those elite circles helped bring on the Russian financial crisis of 1998, which in turn helped the rise of Vladimir Putin. At the time, the future president was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB, reportedly gathering information on these oligarchs and the illegal ways they got rich. The oligarchs largely stood in line with Putin as he rose in the political ranks to prime minister, then president, and they've stayed in line, but that may be changing. Many of these so-called oligarchs have investments in the West, some calling for negotiations to start as soon as possible, others calling for an end to the war altogether. 
I want to go now to Keir Simmons, who joins me live from Moscow. So, Keir, this new task force is going to be working with the FBI, the Secret Service, Homeland Security, et cetera. It feels like a big deal, but, like, what are the chances we're really going to see yachts towed off the coast of Florida anytime soon, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Task Force Klepto Capture. It's a great name, right? Uh, listen, I, I think... One of the secrets of the why, why these sanctions are potentially going to be really effective against the oligarchs, I mean effective in the sense of that they're going to hurt those rich billionaires, is because it's a joined up operation between the US, between Europe, between the UK. In fact, uh, the US isn't naming uh, the oligarchs that it is targeting, but the European Union is and Britain has been. So we have a feeling for who those kinds of people are in the kind of crosshairs, if you like. You know, I think it's something that we don't know. The issue here is, Hallie, we don't know how much of an effect it will have on the Prussian president here in Moscow because these oligarchs in many ways are a distance away from him themselves. But it, I'll give you one example tonight which suggests that it's frightening a few people a lot. Reuters is reporting that according to a ship tracking site, uh, a number of Billionaire Russian billionaires' yachts are heading for the Maldives, which does not have an extradition treaty with the U.S. I was going to ask you about that, Kier. Those reports that we're seeing some of these rich folks move their yachts, right, move some of their assets around, because they do have assets. They have really big boats. They have crypto in some cases, yeah. too, you know, which is a whole other can of worms on this front. Yeah, exactly right. Now, uh, crypto is a obviously a currency that is potentially harder to trace. You can't necessarily use it for enormous amounts of wealth, but and let's just talk about you know hypotheticals here. If you were a very very rich Russian, uh, you what you would try to do would be to put your money in different places. Uh, so I'm not casting aspersions necessarily, uh, but Abramovich, for example, who's close to President Putin, has a close relationship. He owned a big English Premier League football side. Chelsea, or at least he did until today he announced that he is selling that side. Now, he's having trouble staying in the UK. You can see lots of reasons why he would want to sell, but it's just a picture. Again, no aspersions from me on Abramovich. Other folks maybe in government circles have a different point of view. However, uh, you can see how an oligarch like Roman Abramovich has all that money. He's going to spread it out into different yeah. places. That's just kind of a sen sensible thing to do. You make an important point here, and you said it just a second ago. Like, some of these oligarchs are not super close with Putin. There's, there's a limited number of people who are actually in the inner, inner circle near him. You know, tell me yeah. more about that, because you know this, this leader. You have interviewed him. You have been in Russia. You, you understand the dynamics here. Yeah, look, well, of course, the key person is President Putin himself. And just a little bit of politics and diplomacy. We heard Secretary Blinken speaking today, and I thought, and commentators are talking about one particular aspect of what he had to say that was really, really interesting. And that was that he called on President Putin to pursue diplomacy. And Secretary Blinken said, we stand ready to do the same thing. He said to President Putin, if you pull back and pursue diplomacy, we stand ready to do the same thing. Is that a message that Secretary Blinken is sending to the Russian leader to say, well, if you have a ceasefire in Ukraine and pursue diplomacy, we'll halt this uh, push towards more and more sanctions. Is, is that something that that, uh, is they're trying to message because clearly they need to get president they need to give president putin uh, some options here they, they don't want to see him uh, with his uh, back up against the wall yeah a cornered putin right if his military front is stalled if the economic piece of it is falling out from under him because of these sanctions that's a dangerous putin Kier simmons uh, thank you yeah. so much for being live for us in moscow with your reporting great you to see you up next the nypd says it's looking for a man who apparently attacked seven asian women within a matter of just two hours. That's coming up in The Local. And we're learning more about the first January 6th defendant to go to trial, why a prosecutor says he, quote, lit the match that started the riot. Straight ahead. Some families right now feel like they are living in fear in Texas. Why? They're really concerned the state could investigate them just for taking care of their transgender kids. 
We're going to explain in a minute. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, New York City police are looking for a man who allegedly attacked seven Asian women all separately over the span of two hours. It apparently happened over the weekend in Manhattan. They say the suspect punched and elbowed these women in the face before taking off. The NYPD wants the public for any help they can get to catch this guy. So you've seen this surveillance video. Listen, take a close look there. From our West Coast Bureau, the Los Angeles Fire Department has named its first female fire chief. There she is. The city council confirmed Kristen Crowley yesterday on the first day of Women's History Month. She's the first woman to lead the LAFD in its 136-year history, and she's the department's first openly gay leader as well. And from our D.C. Bureau, if you bought a lottery ticket in Rockville, Maryland in September, go check on it, because time's running out to get the $10 million Powerball that you are owed. And nobody has claimed the prize yet. This person only has until the 28th to collect their millions. The attention of every person in this newsroom is now on our television cameras, because half of them live in Rockville. Let's see. Turning now to what's going on with the January 6th investigation, prosecutors say... One of these defendants, in their words, lit the match that started the fire at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. We're talking about Guy Ruffett. He's from Texas. Prosecutors say he had a gun while he led the assaults on the Capitol. All of this is coming out in opening statements of this case, the first riot-related case to go to trial. The defense says the government's case is based on, quote, bragging and a lot of hype. Pete Williams has been following this trial and joins us now. So, Pete, Walk us through some of the the things that you found most interesting from the openings today and what that tells you about the strategy moving forward. Well, the, of course, every ca- every one of these cases is going to be different. We're paying a lot of attention to this one because this the is first. the first right. trial. And by the way, the judge gave a very interesting instruction to the jury today. I don't think a judge has ever given this instruction in federal court before. He told the jury to turn off the push notifications on their phone. No way. And that may be partly a reflection of what happened in the Sarah Palin trial, where jurors apparently found out that the judge was going to throw the charges out while they were still deliberating. They said that didn't affect their decision. But, you know, judges always tell jurors, don't follow news coverage. Right. If you hear about it, walk out of the room, turn the TV off. Because they're or not whatever. sequestered. That's right. right. So he's now added this push notification hmm. uh, advice to the jury. So we had the, the opening statements today from the prosecution. And as you sketched out, the prosecutors are saying that Guy Reffitt helped was one of the leaders of the people. They called him the, the pointy end of the spear, leading people up the stairs, tussling with the police. Now, he never actually entered the Capitol, but they say he was wearing a handgun, that he bought illegally two weapons into the district and was wearing the handgun when he came. The second part of it is, dealing with the obstruction part of this, is very interesting, because when he got back to Texas, the prosecutors told the jury today that he told his two of his children that if they told the police or the FBI what he did, that he would shoot them. And that the son is expected to testify against his dad. Not only testify, but the son apparently, according to prosecutors, also recorded using his cell phone what his father was saying. And that audio will be played for the jury. That feels like it is going to be a dramatic moment as this unfolds, no? Yes, I think. And I think the tricky thing for the government, though, will be this. Uh, You know, this is the man's children on the stand. Now, clearly, the son feels estranged from the family because he did, in fact, as they say, drop a dime on his father. He did. He did tell the FBI that my dad came and did all these things. But the government can't be, appear to be pushing them too hard. You know, it's going to be kind of a, a fine line to walk. They don't want to get the jury's sympathy. Oh, look what they're doing to this man's children. Right. They still want to elicit their testimony, though. And the defense, you know, has this duty in front of them to, to try to paint Guy Reffitt. Uh, do, will they try to paint him as more of a sympathetic character? Will they try to... Def- how, how, what's their tactic here? The, I think, based on the opening statements, their tactic will be that the charges don't fit the conduct. Now... One of the things the prosecutor said is that when Guy Riffett was on his way to Washington, he was talking to this fellow three percenter who, by the way, will testify under a grant of immunity about what he intended to do. And they also say that during the riot, Riffett had was wearing a camera and that it recorded him saying he wants to drag Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell out of the Capitol by their hair. Now, what what his lawyer said is, look, this is all hyperbole. He didn't assault anybody. He didn't tell anybody else to assault anyone. And yes, he made a lot of outrageous statements, but he never actually 
uh, did anything damaging. The other piece that's interesting about this is it's a case that's actually going to trial, right? Because as you know and as you've reported on this show before, a, a lot of these cases end up in, in plea agreements in some instances, or the, the defendants will plead guilty. Yeah, 200 of them so far. Right, including one person today who's sort of interesting. Tell us about it. Well, that hearing is just getting underway now in federal court. This is Joshua James, and I think what makes this interesting is remember that just in January, the government gave the, put out this whole new set of indictments against the uh, the uh, Oath Keepers, including the head of the Oath Keepers, uh, charging him with seditious conspiracy. So that's one of these 11 defendants who has right. been charged with seditious conspiracy. Joshua James, according to court documents, is prepared. He just said in court he wants to plead guilty to reduce charges. You don't even have a. I just got that email from your producer, Dan Barnes. You must have a direct line right to him because we just, you know. You don't I even can't reveal my sources. Unbelievable. Pete Williams communicating <laughs> with telepathy. Thank you so much, Pete. I'm really glad to have you here for that breakdown. It's good to see you. You bet. Coming up next, a lawsuit claims Texas is investigating the parents of trans teens. We'll talk about how some of these families say they're just trying to protect themselves and how the state's responding after the break. Some families in Texas say they're really scared of what a new order from the governor might mean for their transgender kids. In a new lawsuit filed by the ACLU, one mom with a trans daughter says Governor Abbott's order has, quote, terrorized her family and inflicted irreparable harm, she says. She's one of many parents who could face a child abuse investigation for providing gender-affirming treatments to their children. That's under a new order that Texas has passed. Now, the ACLU is saying the Texas Department of Children's and Family Services is actually investigating one of its own employees. The family reportedly had an investigator show up at their door to interview them about their trans teen. The lawsuit says the investigator also allegedly tried to get access to the teen's medical records. No response yet from the state of Texas. But I want to bring in NBC Out reporter Joe Yurkeba, who's reporting on all of this for us. So, Joe, tell me what you're hearing from parents. Sure, yeah. So parents of trans minors in Texas are terrified that they'll be investigated or reported and that their children could be taken away from them um, for providing, you know, what doctors have told them is medically necessary care. And they're also really tired because some of these, some of them have been fighting these battles in the Texas legislature since 2015 when the state considered a bathroom bill. And, you know, one parent told me that the attacks against the trans community there are relentless. What are we hearing from the state on this? I know they're not responding specifically to the suit, but the governor, you know, ever since this new order came out, it has been controversial. But um, leaders in that state really haven't backed away from it. Right, Joe? Right, yeah. Um, the state is, you know, standing by the order. They believe that the care that trans minors are receiving isn't medically necessary. But, you know, doctors have told me that the evidence just isn't really on their side. Can you explain for folks who aren't as familiar as we are with this what this order specifically says? Sure, yeah. So the directive says that anyone in the state, um, you know, any citizen, but especially mandatory reporters such as psychologists and teachers, um, need to report if they believe that a minor is receiving some kind of gender affirming medical care. And that includes anything from puberty blockers um, to hormones uh, and then to surgeries. But it kind of, you know, relies on this misguided idea that minors are receiving surgeries um, when that just isn't the case. So walk us through then what the sort of legal battle would be for both sides here, because, you know, there, there is a question, even among some experts, that some of this holds up in court. Yeah, so there are a few arguments coming from the ACLU that the directive is unconstitutional and circumvents the Texas legislative process. And then the attorney general's opinion and the governor's directive, you know, focus on this idea of medical necessity. And both parents and doctors have told me, you know, that all relevant accredited medical associations say that this is medically necessary care. So they think that even the order itself is on their side. Um, but again, the other side is really relying on this idea that it isn't medically necessary, um, but they just don't have a lot of science to support that opinion. What kind of position does this order put people in who are trying to help trans kids, like, you know, psychologists, et cetera? Yeah, it puts them in a really difficult position, especially if they're mandatory reporters. The ACLU is representing one psychologist who said that she'd be violating professional standards and would inflict serious harm and trauma on her clients if she reported trans minors like the governor's directive tells her to. Joe Yurkeba, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting and for staying on top of this story for us uh, here on NBC News Now. I appreciate it. Appreciate all you for watching this hour. 60 minutes. It flies by. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. I look forward to seeing you then. Coverage picks up right now.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.